Welcome into the room, a podcast brought to you by the LFC Transfer Room. I'm Jack Edwards, joined by Alex Caddick. We have a delighted to a very special guest for today's show, Gary Taphouse, a football commentator for Sky Sports and Premier League Productions, among many other things. Gary, thank you very much for joining us here today. Yeah, no, delighted. How are you guys? I'm doing very well. Um, and today we're going to hit on a, a variety of things, your career in broadcasting, working at some of the premier media companies in the world, and advice we're looking to follow in your footsteps. But I can just kind of establish you know, your journey and where you're at right now. Well, tell us what you do at the moment. Yeah, so at the moment, um, I've been with Sky since 2005, so feeling really old. Um, generally, what I do at the moment is um, a game for match choice every week. So that goes live around the world um, via the Premier League. And then you can watch in the evening um, a sort of 30-minute edit on Saturday nights, or if it's the game of the day, then the full match goes out at eight o'clock. Um, also for Sky, I do live EFL. So I did um, the Watford Middlesbrough game, marking their centenary last week. I've got West Bromwich Albion against Birmingham coming up um, in midweek. Um, a few other things for them as well. Uh, AFCON last year, for example, um, in the past, I've done the Champions League before that went to BT. Um, yeah, and then elsewhere, I freelance for other people. So um, Europa League and Champions League and FA Cup for Gravity Media, um, internationals for IMG, um, Carabao Cup and others for Pitch International. Again, they go all around the world. So very, very, very busy. I do about 130 TV commentaries a season. Um, and that's a mixture of being at the ground and some um are done in studios depending on who it's for and where it's going um so yeah it's there's a lot of driving up and down the country i, I live in the south coast uh, in bournemouth so a lot of driving up the m3 to london um for the off tube stuff as well so you know really varied um and yeah fan it's just a, it's just a fantastic job if you love football and love the sound of your own voice as i do so um it's a win-win no if for anyone who i think wants a career in football it sounds like the perfect thing so i think best thing to do would be rewind all the way back to the beginning for you what was the inspiration that you wanted to be in football in broadcasting as a future well the inspiration really was italia 90 the world cup um i was what 14 i guess something like that um it was the first time where i really watched every single game in the tournament um even to the extent of bunking off school <laughs> or, or watching it at school um and yeah, I, I, I really paid attention to the broadcast side of it as well as the football. And um, it was the, really the first time where I thought I was listening to John Motson and Barry Davis and Brian Moore and all of those guys, those legendary voices and thinking, well, you know, that is their job. That's what they do for a living. It just travel the world watching football and, and talking about it and having their voice on those moments forever immortalized on video and um yeah that just really appealed to me i thought this, this is what i want to do i think my mum and dad just sort of laughed and said yeah you'll, you'll be doing a real job um but yeah I, I, you know the, the thing is with any job like this you a you have to have the sort of fervent desire to go for it but you also have to have an incredible amount of good fortune and good timing um and that's kind of what happened for me. I, I, I made my choices with regards to education with that in mind, that job in mind. Um, I did a, a degree in multimedia journalism at, at Bournemouth University. I'd never been to Bournemouth in my life, but they, they were the only place that gave me an offer. And it was a really, really good course. So I, I went down there and, and I loved it so much. I dragged my family back 20 years later to live here. Um, but whilst I was there, while I was there in Bournemouth, um, there was no such thing as a, like a sports degree or anything at that time, sports journalism degree, but an opportunity came up to actually commentate on AFC Bournemouth games for the club. And that opportunity came up just by me overhearing a conversation. Um, a girl I was living with uh, in, in a shared student house, she was going out with a cameraman for a local production company who'd been given the contract to film Bournemouth's home games for the club. Um, they were only in th third tier at the time. 
And um, I just happened to overhear him saying that they were using a commentator who was a vice president of the club. Um, and he wasn't great. He wasn't he wasn't always available. And they were looking for someone else to do it. And I just immediately leapt in and said, well, that's right up my street. Would you give me a go? And um, and they did. I, I went to Bournemouth against Bristol Rovers a few days later. And um, it was literally just me the cameraman and a microphone like this plugged into one camera. Um, and yeah, it was all just done on one camera. They said, look, it goes to the club. You can buy a video of this in the club shop if you want, if you're desperate to. Um, and and yeah, it, it went okay. Ended up doing every game that season, every home game. And I also um, was asked to write the and present the end of season VHS video for for AFC Bournemouth. If you remember those, maybe I'm too old. I'm too old, and you don't remember them. But um, I was just so excited because we did it, and I went into HMV in Bournemouth, and there it was on sale. So actually leaving university with those tapes was probably every bit as valuable, if not more so, than actually having the degree because it was tangible proof that I was I could do the job. Um, and I, I just, in my naivety, thought, right, well, there we go. I'm a football commentator now. I'm going to leave university and go and, and go and be a football commentator. And of course, that doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> you don't just leave university and go and work for Sky Sports or the BBC. And I actually got a job as um, a news reporter on my local newspaper in South London. Um, not what I wanted to do, but it was the only thing I could find. Um, and they did actually report on Crystal Palace. So I got to do a bit of that. Um, and actually, the first or second week I was there, another bit of good fortune because um, a fax came through, again, showing my age, but a fax came through from a company who were launching Palace Radio at Crystal Palace FC. They were launching a match day AM radio station, and I was invited to the launch to cover it for the newspaper. And while I was there, again, I sort of flagged the opportunity of maybe doing some commentaries for them. And and they said, yes, I, I went to the next game, which was Palace against Chelsea. And I ended up doing the entire season and the next season for them. So that's how I started getting into radio commentary. And from there, I was sitting next to the guys from Capital Gold. Jonathan Pierce was doing his thing back then. Anyone who lived in London at the time was listening to that. And I got to know all those guys and an opportunity came to do some reporting for them. So that's how it really kicked off for me. But that was just kind of a hobby that I was doing at weekends while I was doing my real job. Um, so it's quite a long road to get to a stage where you're earning money for doing commentating. Um, I think, you, you know, you are expected to sort of do the hard yards for free beforehand, just so that you actually understand how it all works and, and you, you know, improve. The only way to improve at commentating is to do it, as with most things. Um, and obviously, no company worth their salt is going to say to someone who's green, wet behind the ears, here, take this microphone and go and commentate on this game. They want proof that you can do it and you know what you're doing. In terms of, um, you know, education and the process of that, I'm currently a sports journalism student myself. Uh, it's quite an eye open experience. Do you know when you first went to uni, did perhaps you see any other forms of journalism where you thought, do you know what, this this takes me interest too, or was it always commentaries the one for you? Yeah, it was always commentating, if I'm honest. I mean, I um, I got to do some quite interesting stuff at uni, actually. I did some stuff with the, the Bournemouth Echo, doing some advertorials and some interviews, and it was all great. I really enjoyed it. I know I, I've always loved writing um, and talking to people, but it just didn't light my fire in the same way. Um, you know, picking up a microphone, the roar of the crowd, um, you know, that little bit of uh, adrenaline and excitement and not knowing what's going to unfold in the next 90 minutes before you, you just, I just can't beat that. So I think whatever else I did would be second best. Um, and obviously you, you don't know that <laughs> that chance is going to come your way. I mean, um, just to sort of go on a bit from, from where I left it, I didn't get a chance to work for Sky until I was 29 years old. So I went to uni 10 years before that. So it's, it was a really, really long road. I ended up um, going to work for Opta, the, the stats people, which was a very, very small company at the time. Um, and I was then doing capital stuff at the weekend. Um, and it wasn't until I was 25, I think, that the opportunity came to do a full-time job actually working in radio. 
um, a company had, had set up uh, digital radio stations at several football clubs, including Chelsea, and they wanted uh, people to to work on them. And and I managed to get that opportunity. So I left Opta in 2001, um, and that was the first time that I was actually being paid a full time wage to to work in radio. And, and and that was an amazing opportunity because I got to commentate on every single Chelsea game for the next five years, home and away traveling with the team all over Europe in the Champions League with Kerry Dixon, um, Chelsea legend. Um, and that's where I really learned about being a commentator. And obviously at that time, Abramovich had bought the club and Mourinho came in and all the new signers came in and the in media interest in the club was going through the roof. So I got to know all the people from Sky. Um, when the, the opportunity came for Match Choice to come along and they needed commentators at all the three o'clock games I was in a really good position to say to the guys I knew could you put in a good word for me because it's all a hustle the whole industry is a hustle you're constantly badgering people and ringing people and and it is important to actually speak to them it's really easy just to send an email or something but you actually need that personal touch in this industry they've got to know you so you know I had to pluck up the courage several times to phone the producer and and really sort of um nudge him a few times and eventually eventually um 2005 he gave me a game Fulham against Manchester City um at Craven Cottage I hadn't done any TV before um and so you can imagine how nervous I was I was with Nigel Spackman knew I knew it was going to 202 countries and <laughs> I was just so terrified um but that was when I just thought, wow, finally, here I am. It's been 10 years, but I'm finally doing a TV commentary, which is going to other countries. And that was, yeah, it was an incredible feeling. But you can see along the way, so much good fortune. You've got to grasp those opportunities. And you've really got to put yourself out there and badger people because no one else is going to, um, no one else is going to promote you. You've got to do it yourself. And so you've got to have this, a, a lot of self-belief that you're doing the right thing. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a long road, but um, yeah, I've been doing that ever since. So thankfully, it went okay. You mentioned you know born with when they were in the third tier, Chelsea kind of at the beginning of the Abramovich era. How important with those opportunities was it that you kind of came in at an interesting spot for the clubs and almost in the Bournemouth case, you got into a spot that maybe had a lower barrier of entry and Chelsea you kind of ride that rise up that they had as a club for that and the luck aspect of things that you mentioned. How important was that in terms of getting those opportunities maybe earlier on in your career yeah yeah timing timing is everything in football on and off the pitch um you know that Chelsea opportunity um I really am denied about that because I knew digital radio is really in its infancy um and actually it was broadcast on Sky Digital it was on a Sky Digital channel with a blue screen and audio in the background and I wondered to myself is anyone actually going to be listening to this um and actually eventually the club took it over themselves they decided to bring it in-house and and I, I became a member of staff um and then the the strangest thing happened completely out of the blue um peter kenyon became chief executive at chelsea and he decided to sell those rights to smooth fm in london um and so and, and they took me on they took me and carry on so suddenly we were broadcasting live in FM across London, but only Chelsea games and with music as well. So uh, we had to have this totally bizarre situation where the presenter would be playing, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire, and then they'd be going to me for for Chelsea against Liverpool. So uh, completely mad. But again, that was another sort of stepping stone because, again, great timing. I, 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 it, it didn't work for Smooth at all. I don't know why they decided to do it. Um, because they didn't have rights to any other club in London. It was just Chelsea. So obviously when it was Chelsea Arsenal, I needed to find an Arsenal pundit as well as a Chelsea pundit. Otherwise, no Arsenal fans would ever listen. So I was sitting there with Kerry Dixon on one side and Paul Davis on the other. And the same for all the other London derbies. When we played um, Charlton, I had Graham Stewart there as well, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, that was another step along the road. But again, very fortunate that that opportunity came along when it did. And and, and as I said to you before, even though you, you get that fortune, you've still got to take that opportunity and, and ride with it and do a really good job. Otherwise, you know, it's a wasted one. Um, and with regards to Bournemouth, well, yeah, I mean, they were at the time absolutely broke. I mean, that, that was a stage where we really thought the club was going to go 
um, out of the, out of business, out of existence. There were people collecting money in buckets, you know, in the winter gardens before games. Um, so a, a, a good fortune that a, a local production company, who, which is still going now, still doing a great job, um, they were they were given that contract to, to film games, and yeah. They just had happened to need a commentator and I just happened to be in the right place. Without that, I think if I hadn't been done that at Bournemouth, I doubt I would be doing what I'm doing now. So I'd encourage anyone who's at uni to look for what opportunities are out there. I know some of the guys at this university work with um, Pool Town just down the road, non-league club. Um, and it's an opportunity to interview players and and um, get their voices on YouTube. And it's just all about leaving university with something that you can show people that you can do the job having a degree is one thing but you're going to be competing against other graduates who have lots of experience which they've picked up over the three years so what i say to all the students because i do some lecturing myself and what i say to all the students is don't just rely on this degree to get you a job because we are churning out hundreds and hundreds of brilliant graduates every single year and they're all fighting over the same opportunity so you've got to find a way of standing out from that crowd and the way you do it is to have either a cuttings file full of uh, published work that you've you've done or brilliant podcasts like this that you can show look this is i've been broadcasting or or working with with smaller football clubs that um have given you that opportunity um this some of my students have, have actually done some proper commentary for non-league clubs and again they've left uni and actually got opportunities as a result of that so um I don't think you can do enough. <laughs> you you know, you do have a lot of free time as a student, and I, I certainly did. Um, and it's about using that wisely because it's very tempting to just sort of coast through and have the bit of paper at the end of it. But anything that you can do during that time that's going to help you stand out from the crowd is just utterly invaluable. And and for me, it was that, that v, those VHS tapes. That, that's what got me into the industry. Yeah, the one thing we're told at the minute is just be proactive, be proactive, go out there and, and do as much as you can. But um, in terms of the Chelsea experience, um, it's such a renowned era in football now, looking back on it, you know, Mourinho um, coming in, uh, Bramovic, like you said. Do you have a favourite memory or story or even a game from your, your time there? Oh, gosh, there's just so many because, um, you know, we were in a quite a privileged position because we were in house. We were at the training ground a lot. We spoke to um, the players and Mourinho all the time. And we did become sort of part of the traveling band at, at that time. Um, and there's just so many amazing memories. I mean, funnily enough, um, the Champions League games against Liverpool always stick out, not because of the games, because they were largely dreadful. But um, that's. Luis Garcia ghost goal game I'll never ever forget because we turned up there and I have never ever before or since known a noise like that and I think if you speak to anyone who was at that game they'll probably tell you something very very similar we were on air um an hour before and my producer back at Stanford Bridge was saying Gary we we just can't hear you can you turn your crowd effects microphone down and I said we don't have a crowd effects microphone. It's, it's not even on. And it was just the sheer volume of noise um, coming from that Anfield crowd. Um, and I seem to remember when Joe Cole um, joined Liverpool, that's one of the things he mentioned as well was, was that particular game. That the, the, the noise levels were simply off the scale. I'll never, ever forget that, even though the game was awful. Um, obviously, going to Barcelona, there was an incredible tie between Chelsea and Barcelona when... Um, Ronaldinho scored that incredible goal at Stamford Bridge, which Chelsea actually got through. They won 4-2 um, in the second leg. Um, that will always, always stick with me. But yeah, there was just some, you know, wonderful moments and some tense moments as well. I remember we were, we were flying to somewhere in the Champions League and um, Kerry and I were just at, at the airport taking it easy. And I said, you know, I think we'd better go to the gate, Kerry, because you know, it's getting close to the flight time. And he was very much, no, no, we've got loads of time. Of course, we then heard our names on the tannoy with passengers, tap Taps and Dixon come to gate four now, the plane's about to leave. And so we had to walk past Mourinho and all the players glaring at us because we'd held up the flight. So I'll never forget those laser eyes boring into me. Um, ama amazing times. It was just an incredible experience. Um, 
you know, I actually had quite a good, um, we, we all at the station had quite a good relationship with Mourinho. He gave us some really good interviews at that time. And that was brilliant, arrogant Mourinho, that first spell. Um, you can watch some incredible interviews from him at, at, at that time. And um, whatever you thought of him, he was pure box office. Um, and, and I was so lucky to have so many great, even two and three minute interviews in the pre and post match, you'd always get something, you'd always get a great soundbite. So it was a brilliant, brilliant time to work in there. That's for sure. You mentioned kind of some of the great atmospheres you've called matches in and had a, your first TV broadcast, how nervous you would be at times. If you're ever in a broadcast where it's a big moment, you know, this is a, a really, you know, maybe in the season for a team's for the storylines are all converging. It's a really big moment as a broadcaster. How do you stay composed? How do you kind of stay focused on things in those really big moments? Well, these days, um, yeah, that, that's not a problem these days, you know, 1,500 games later. But yeah, I mean, at the beginning, it was really difficult. I just wanted to be sick <laughs> before the game. I can remember that very clearly, feeling really queasy. Um, and I suppose all you can say is once you actually start and there's people queuing you and talking in your ear constantly and you're reading a script and, and having a conversation with the cocom you it, it just settles you down straight away um i don't people maybe don't realize quite how much we are hearing in our ears i mean there's just constant chat from the director and the producer because you're hearing the director talk to everyone not just you you're hearing him talk to the camera people to the replay people back to sky and it is just constant talk and you've got to filter that so you're only hearing what you need to hear um so for the Premier League as well, we'll have a uh, producer, director and another director back at um, Stockley Park who's also giving us information. So, um, yeah, that took a long time to get used to because I wasn't I wasn't ready for that. Having done radio when you're just talking all the time um, and very few words in your ear to suddenly then go to a situation where you're not talking very much at all, but you're constantly being spoken to. That was a that was a real eye, a, a real eye opener, a bit of a shock, actually. Um, but yeah, you very quickly get used to it. And like I said to you, the only way you ever improve is to just keep doing the job. Um, so you've kind of got to, you've got to ride the waves in, the, in those first few games when you're, you know, that you're not at your best. And I mean, I certainly couldn't listen to anything I did in that first year for Sky. It'd just be horrendous, but you've just got to do enough so that, um, you keep getting asked back and eventually you get used to it and, 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 and do your thing and your voice gets better and your confidence improves. And, um, yeah, now I don't feel nervous at all. I just feel that excitement, that adrenaline buzz before any game, because like I say, you never know what's going to happen in, in the coming 90 minutes. And it, it could be something really, really special about to happen. Um, and I think it's that, that unscripted drama um, is what it's all about for all of us who who commentate really because it's um, it's pretty unique. If if you, if you commentate on sport, you know you you're talking about hundreds of hours over the course of a season where essentially you don't know what's going to happen and it's unscripted, um, and that is a brilliant brilliant adrenaline rush. You mentioned listening back to broadcasts. Do you ever listen back to that Bournemouth versus Bristol Rovers match? That was your very first no, one. No. <laughs> Do you know what? I don't even know where that tape is. It's probably in the loft somewhere. But no, I I could not watch that and do you know what my, when i got married um my best man got hold of the end of season tape somehow and played a clip in front of everyone on the big screen at our wedding reception and i was utterly mortified because there was a bit where i had to take a penalty in one of the um scripted bits between and it was just absolutely ghastly i was wearing really baggy chinos and big massive glasses and i just couldn't believe he dug it out so yeah no I, there's no way i'm ever watching any of that or listening back to any of that um for me that's all part of the learning process and it needs to stay hidden in the past forever but in terms of you know listening back to broadcast because i'm also yeah. a sports journalism broadcast journalism student here in the united states um we're told you know listen back to your broadcast stuff like yeah. that in the moment in your process, both in your career development and now, how do you kind of go about listening back to what you've done and kind of develop? Yeah, I mean, find, finding time to actually listen back to stuff is is a challenge, and I don't do it very often these days. What I will do is um, try and listen back to something from a year ago. So I'd completely forgotten the game, completely forgotten what happens, and then just try and listen to it as a viewer and think, right, 
what did I like about that and what didn't I like about that? And what that has taught me over the years is, firstly, talk less, because no one ever says about a commentator, do you know what? I wish he talked more. Um, exactly the opposite. And and the thing is, when you get into the job initially, you think to yourself, right, I'm being paid to talk here, so I need to talk. And actually, knowing when not to talk is every bit as important, if not more so. So, um, you know, as uh, as Richie Benno famously said, if you've got something you can say that will enhance the pictures, then say it. If you haven't, then shut up. And that is something I've really taken on board the longer I've done it. And I think hopefully people, if anyone watches a game I do, you'll notice that there'll be times when I might not say anything for 30 seconds or more, just because if you're at a game, you just want to watch the game, don't you? You don't, you don't want some idiot behind you just bleating useless and interest, uninteresting stats in the background. So, you know, I try to use stats very sparingly only when they're really, really pertinent and relevant. Um, and if a team is just playing it along the back four, then just, you know, I literally just put the microphone down and just let it breathe. Um, and it's something that you, I think you only, again, you only learn by actually doing it and, and by watching it back. I, I watched, I think maybe my second or third year at Sky, I, I watched a, a game back and just thought, why don't you just shut up? <laughs> it was like I had a whole list of facts and stats that I was determined to crowbar in. Um, and it just, it was just a noise in the end. So yeah, um, I try not to watch back something I've done very recently. It'll be, it'll be something from a long time ago where I can't really remember what I, what was happening or what happened in the game and then just really judge it impassively. And of course I asked my wife because there's no one who's more brutal about what I do than my own wife. She'll just say that was absolutely horrendous or in fact, that's pretty much what she says most of the time. I very rarely get a compliment. If I get a compliment, then I know it's really good. Um, so yeah, get people you trust to have a quick listen and say, I like that bit. I really didn't like that. Change that. Don't say that. Think about saying this. And it, again, I leave every single game thinking, why did I say that? Or why didn't I say that? And um you know, you've just, you're constantly learning, you're constantly trying to perfect the job. And I don't think you ever can really, but you can, you can always get better, always. You mentioned them, um, your past need to start sort of cramming stats and facts there. Um, how long does it take to prepare for each commentary? Yeah, I mean, it really varies because, um, I, I like to allow as, as a rough guide about six hours for a game. Um, but obviously there are some that I might be able to do quicker if it's two teams I've seen very recently, um, you making, you might put less time in. And also you've got to remember that with Sky, we've got a fantastic team of people who put together stat packs for every game that we broadcast. I think there's about 16 of them and they're brilliant, brilliant people. Um, so we do get a bit of help there. Um, when it's not for Sky, then we are starting from scratch and that does take a lot longer. And obviously if it's, um, if I'm doing a live league one game or a league two game, it may be teams that I haven't seen for a very long time or, or at all. And then I will sit and watch loads and loads of footage, um, before I even look at, um, individual player stats and stuff. So it, it can vary. And obviously there, there might be some weeks where, I might have five games in six days and then it is just constantly you're either prepping, traveling or at a game and there's literally no time for anything else in between. Um, and that's what you want. But, you know, those are fantastic weeks because it's just um, it's just a real buzz. In fact, um, you know, I, I, we don't know what's going to happen next week with um, with the week of morning. But assuming everything goes ahead, I've got um, an EFL game Tuesday an EFL game Wednesday and the UEFA Youth League game. I've also got a Europa League game on Thursday and then Premier League Saturday and the live WSL game in Liverpool on Sunday. So every available minute <laughs> when I'm not sleeping is going to be spent prepping something um, ahead of those matches. So, you know, that's what you want. It's, it's just um, a nonstop buzz. When people say to me, what would you do the rest of the week? I just show them my diary and say, well, there you go. That's what I'm doing. We've talked a little bit about it so far, kind of your start at Sky Sports back in 2005. Kind of want to dig a little bit more into that and kind of how you got your foot in the door there, what those early experiences were like and how it's kind of developed in all those years since. 
Yeah, so um, like I say, I was uh, doing every Chelsea game. I got chatting to people like Martin Tyler and Rob Hawthorne and um, people behind the scenes. And um, along came this new programme called Football First, which is now Match Choice. And um, Sky got the rights to show these delayed um, highlights of every single three o'clock game. And suddenly Sky just didn't have enough commentators. They had enough co-coms, um, but they didn't have enough commentators. So they were actively looking for, uh, inverted commas, new talent, um, you know, one or two new people to come along. And um, I was sort of vaguely aware of this in the background. And uh, I spoke to both Martin and Rob and a couple of others. And I said, you know, who's producing this? Uh, is there any chance you'd give me his contact details? Any chance you could even put in a nice word for me? Um, which they did, which was really, really kind. And I can remember the producer saying, oh, yeah, I spoke to Rob Hawthorne about you. He And Rob actually took away one of my um, CDs of a, a game I did. And he listened to it and he rang me back and said, I thought this is really good. I thought that was not so good. And he gave me some incredibly constructive feedback. I'm incredibly grateful to him. And also John Murray did the same um, at, at the BBC. He um, he took a, a CD of mine and uh, we sat down in the in the press room at Chelsea and he went through things in, in great detail. I'm incredibly grateful to those guys for that because that was um, unbelievably helpful. And so, yeah, the, the producer, um, I, I got his number um i gave him a ring and there was sort of silence at the other end <laughs> initially he was thinking who the hell is this guy and then he did say oh yeah 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 um rob portal mentioned something about you i think and he goes yeah yeah now you're in my thoughts i'll i'll definitely bear you in mind um i'll be in touch put the phone down and i didn't hear anything um for several weeks and that's you know i think anyone who's a freelance in this industry then has that awful dilemma of do you just let it go and hope that he'll think of you or do you start hassling people and ring again? And I decided to go for the latter option because I just think you've got to grasp the nettle in these situations and um, it, nothing falls into your lap. You've got to make it happen. So I rang him back and um, maybe he just wanted to get rid of me. I don't know. But he just said, you know what? Um, there's only a few weeks of the season left. Um, I do actually have a slot at Fulham next week. Do you fancy doing it? And that was it. You know, I just thought, thank God I made that call because perhaps nothing would have happened if I hadn't badgered him. And I was very nice about it, you know. Um, but I do think it's important, to, as I said earlier, to have that actual human contact. So you are talking to them. They do feel they know your voice. Um, I don't think anything would have happened if I just sent a polite email. I'm really odd. These people get so many, they get deluged with emails on a daily basis. Um, from people they do know, never mind people they don't. So I think you've got to, you've got to have that. Um, you've got to phone them. You've got to phone them up. And uh, so yeah, and 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 that's how it happened. That's how I got that first game. And then on the back of that, it was very close to the end of the season in 2005. And um, I remembered that obviously all the games kick off at the same time in the last week. So I said to him, look, any chance? in a couple of weeks when all the games kick off at the same time you use me then. And he goes, yep, that's a great idea. I probably will need someone then. So keep it free. And he was as good as his word. I did do a game. Um, however, disaster struck. I'll, I'll, I won't go into all the details, but what I had an absolute nightmare. Um, I stepped outside my house. This was Aston Villa against Manchester City. I stepped outside my house and I noticed that my car was missing. It had been stolen. So that was my way of getting to Villa Park, gone. I dashed up to London and got on a train thinking, OK, I've still got time. If this train leaves now, I'll get to Villa Park in time. The whole train went black and there'd been a massive um, power outage in Euston, the whole of the Euston area and no trains were leaving. Um, so that's when I went into panic mode and I rang my wife and she said, get on the tube to Watford and try and get a train from there. Went down to the tube, engineering works, no tubes running. And um, I eventually had to just jump in the taxi and go all the way in a cab to Villa Park at an enormous cost. I think it was something like £600. Um, and he had to drive through the hard shoulder in the roadworks because he took on my quest to get there in time. And I had rung the producer and told him this was happening. Um, but you can imagine only my second or third game for Sky and this was going on. I was just churning, thinking, this is it, my career's over. 
Um, but miraculously, I got to the outskirts of Birmingham with about half an hour to spare. And he said, this is as far as I can take you because the roads are all closed. Boiling hot day, had to run to the ground. Um, I was with Gary Bertles. He found the whole thing absolutely hilarious when I turned up, completely breathless. Um, Rob Palmer was there doing Soccer Saturday and they, he'd been prepped to do the commentary in case I hadn't made it. Um, but of course, he didn't have any of the uh, amount of prep he should have for a commentary. So he was really hoping I'd get there. And I did get there just about in time. And then when they said, Q Gary, huge gust of wind just blew all my notes away. And I had nothing, had no script, no notes, nothing at all. Um, and that was just the icing on the cake. That's how I learned to make sure that you've got your notes in a plastic folder so they can't blow away. So this was all a massive learning curve. And amazingly, I got through the game. I was completely exhausted at the end. And they had... Um, They'd arranged for a taxi to be there to take me home again. So um, it kind of, that, that was a career-saving moment. I really did think it was all over. I just thought, this is going live to 200 countries. I'm not going to be there. Gary Bertels is going to have to commentate on his own. Um, and yeah, it, thankfully, thankfully, it all went okay. There were, I think there was a goal in the first minute. Um, Sean Wright Phillips scored in the first minute, and I wasn't ready for that at all. Um but yeah, so that that was uh, that was a, an absolute horror story, which is which is genuinely true. And you can actually watch those highlights on YouTube. I think you can, if you watch, you can bear in mind what had happened to me in the hours preceding it. Um, but as a result of all that and the drama, I think the producer found it quite funny. I ended up being involved at the start of the following season as well. So um, maybe even that was meant to be. Oh, right. um, since 2005, when you know, started Sky, I was just wondering from that point to now, have you noticed any considerable differences or changes in broadcasting or in your job specifically? Well, there have been changes, obviously, because um, technologies come in, um, not just goal line technology, but VAR, and uh, that's made a big difference to our job because. Um, you know, you can go big on a goal and then suddenly it gets chalked off. And it happened to me last weekend. I did the um, Chelsea West Ham game, which for 60 minutes was going absolutely nowhere. And of course, the final half hour just burst into life. And West Ham thought they pinched a point right at the end of the game. VAR had other ideas, which um, obviously we now know they've acknowledged was a mistake. But I went big on the goal in, as a commentator because it looked a goal to me. Um, and then obviously you feel a bit stupid when <laughs> the goal gets chalked off um, and you have gone big. But I think if you if you say to yourself, well, I'm not going to go big on a goal in, in case it gets chalked off, then you might as well not bother. It's like supporters saying, well, I'm not going to celebrate a goal because VAR might chalk it off. No one does that. People say it, but they don't do it. Um, so that's that's definitely changed our job. And remember, we can hear VAR in our ears as well on top of everything else. Um, when there is a check going on, we can hear the VAR talking to the referee. We can't hear the referee, and obviously we don't broadcast what is said, but we can hear what is said. Um, so you kind of get a good clue as to where it's going. And my heart just sank when I could hear them saying, well, you know, there's contact here, and I just thought, this is going to get chalked off. I don't believe it. So you, you can get a bit mugged off as a commentator. Um, but no, in, in, in terms of the job, you know, not much has changed in terms of how it works. You know, we talk, commentator talks over replays. Um, we might, the director might stick in a corner box, you know, those boxes in the bottom left-hand corner where relevant stats come in and we talk over them. We know it's coming beforehand because there's been a conversation. Um, so, yeah, no, the, I think the job's always been the same. Um I think if you go back 30, 40 years, you'll, if you watch a, a game that went out live, you'll hear very little from the COCOM. You know, they were called a summarizer and they used to summarize every sort of 10 minutes. Now, um, you know, they're chipping in all the time and it's a lot more conversational. And I think that's a lot better personally. I, I, as a viewer, I prefer that. Um, but you know, since I've been involved, I don't think a lot has changed in terms of how the job works. You mentioned kind of with that Chelsea West Ham match, first 60 minutes, kind of boring, not going, you're going anywhere with matches like that, where maybe it's like that for a full 90, where it's kind of just a bit of a, a, a sludge to get through. For you as a broadcaster, are you trying to punch the game up? Are you kind of just going with kind of how the game is in terms of an entertainment factor for a match that doesn't provide entertainment itself? How do you kind of handle that? Yeah, I mean, 
it, that's a really interesting question because it's very easy for us as commentators to sort of sit there and huff and puff and say, well, this is rubbish. But I think you've always got to look at it. You know, we're football fans as well. You've always got to look at it from the fans' perspective. And, you know, huge crowd at Stamford Bridge. The likelihood is that um, there'll be people there who are watching their first matches. Um, and it's just tremendously exciting, regardless of what's happening. Um, and there's always a chance, always a chance that there's something going to happen later on, a stoppage time winner. So you actually look a bit foolish if you spend 90 minutes saying, well, this is garbage. And then there's a really dramatic late winner. So I don't think you 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 can't make a silk purse out of a sales here. And there's there's no point in saying, well, you know, this is actually really intriguing. If, it, if it's a bad game, it's a bad game. But there's always things to talk about. There's always tactical elements to discuss. And there's always looking at why it's not happening for one side or another. So I think we owe it to the audience to try and make things more interesting than perhaps it is on the pitch. Um, and I think no one wants to hear us just moaning about it being a bad game because ultimately we're being paid to be there. So you know, it's an enormous privilege. So, yeah, I, I I never try and hype a game up more than it deserves. If it's a bad game, it's a bad game. But I think we can always look at why it's not occurring. And like I say, that Chelsea West Ham game, if you'd said to me after an hour, this is going to finish nil-nil, I wouldn't have been remotely surprised. It suddenly burst into life. Um, and that can happen, can't it? That we've, we've, we've all been at games where the last 20 minutes has been like a different game. And that's exactly what it was. You mentioned that at the end of the day, you're still a fan of football. Once you turn professional, how did you sort of manage, the, you know, the fandom and the fact that, you know, you're such a big fan of the sport um, in terms of, you know, being a professional as well at the same time? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is that the great irony of doing any job in football is that you spend so many years supporting a team and going to games and then suddenly you're working professionally in the industry and you never get the chance to see that team. And that's... That's certainly the case for me. Um, and I now, you know, I'd say to my producer, look, if if my team, which shall remain nameless, um, if there's ever a chance to do that team, then, you know, I'd love to because it's the only chance I get to see them. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to go with my two boys, but the reality is um, when they're playing, the likelihood is I'm going to be at a different game. So, yeah, that is, that's one big irony of working in football. Um, uh, so yeah, the, you know, people say to me, "How do you commentate on your own team? How do you not show bias?" Well, I find that an astonishing question because the moment I pick up a microphone like this, you're not a fan anymore. You're a broadcaster, and if I showed even the slightest bias, then I wouldn't be doing that team again. So um, I always find it as amazing when people say um, commentators are biased. I, I, you know, it's absolutely staggering to me. All we care about is making sure that the broadcast is good not about who wins that's of no interest whatsoever and the people that say to us you're biased and i get it every game on twitter every game someone will say i thought you were a bit biased well the person that's calling me biased is a fan of one of them those teams and is inherently biased towards that team so who makes you the arbiter of whether i'm biased or not i find that absolutely hilarious um and i always reply and 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 make the point politely that you know these are two teams i have no um I've got no link to either of these teams. Whoever wins is of no consequence to me whatsoever. I just want it to be a really good game and a really good broadcast. Um, that's something that all commentators have to face, and co-coms as well. You're biased. You must be biased. Um, same as referees. They get it too. Um, I think it's just fans venting, really. And I've probably thought it myself, you know, watching my team on TV. I probably thought, well, these commentators are being very nice towards my team. They must be biased. And I've immediately had to curse myself for thinking that because it's so ridiculous. Well, you also mentioned um, the, the fan aspect on social media. Is there ever, you know, kind of having that knowing everyone's watching almost does that ever get to you a little bit you know having a bit of that that public stick you could potentially get after a broadcast but you, do you know what it's much more nerve-wracking um speaking to a room with 10 people in than it is commentating to a whole audience of people you can't see because you can't see them so yeah i i always just think to myself i'm sure no one's watching this i remember doing um 
I remember doing Liverpool Everton in the FA Cup semi final at Wembley um, when Andy Carroll scored the winner um, after Luis Suarez had scored. Um, and they said to me before the game, oh, this is going to the biggest number of countries we've done in the FA Cup. And we, we think there's going to be about three quarters of a billion people watching or something ridiculous like that. And I was like, well, thanks. Thanks for telling me that just as we were about to go on air. Because in my head, I just say to myself, no one's watching. Because the moment you start to think about enormous numbers of people watching, the more nerve wracking it is. Like I say, I'm more nervous chatting to people I can see like you two. It's making me think far more about what I'm saying than if I'm on a gantry talking into the ether. So, um, yeah, that, that doesn't bother me at all. In terms of people getting in touch on social media, you know, generally speaking, I'm quite lucky. I don't get much in the way of abuse. Um, and when I do, I'm, I've got very, very thick skin. I just laugh it off. Most of the time, I actually get um, comment uh, questions from people interested in the broadcast, which is great. I'm more than happy to answer them um, I, rather than people just getting in touch to uh, say you're a rubbish commentator. I don't get much of that, thankfully. Um, if people think it, they generally don't tell me. In terms of um, bias, like you mentioned before, uh, we've seen more and more now in terms of co-coms, like Neville and Carragher, they tend to, um, they're starting to sort of do the teams that they publicly support. I was just wondering how you feel on the, you know, the idea of co-coms um, uh, commentating on games of teams they support and you know whether that leaves them open to criticism. criticism well, it, it may well do, which is why I don't say who I support. But equally, they are professional broadcasters and they've been doing it for a very long time. And I think, like I said to you, when you pick up a microphone, it is like a footballer crossing the white line. You are a professional and you're there to do a professional job. So when I'm commentating on my team, Yes, before the game, half time, after the game, I'm a passionate fan of that team. But during the 90 minutes, honestly, I can tell you, I am not thinking um, I'm a fan. I really am not thinking that. I just, you, you just go into professional mode. Now, I can't speak for those guys, but I'd imagine it's exactly the same for them. Um, and, and, and if anything, you end up being maybe a little bit even more critical of your own team um perhaps subconsciously trying to um to balance things out that's certainly what i've found um and the, it's very funny because i've had um fellow fans of the club i support messaging me saying um you obviously hate our team because <laughs> you were so harsh against them um and that always makes me laugh because i thought well you know the absolute opposite of that is true um you know, and I've heard um, the guys you're talking about being extremely critical of their of their own team. So, um, it, you know, it, OK, it's an easy way for fans to say, well, you used to play for them, therefore you must be biased. Um, I, I think they'd probably laugh that off, if I'm honest. I think they'd say, well, we're, we're there to do a job and we're there to do it professionally. You mentioned your university lecturer as well. I'm interested in kind of how you're enjoying that experience and kind of how that got started as well. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I don't do a huge amount of that. Um, UCFB at Wembley Stadium, um, there's one at Manchester City as well and another one at Burnley. Um, they approached me and said, we want to just talk, um, we want to have a module for our first years who are studying a variety of courses, including sports journalism. I think there's another one where sport and business and, and various others. They want, we want them to have a module where they learn about match commentary specifically. So they said to me, can you come up with just a, a one-term module where you talk to them once a week for an hour and a half um, about the job and, and um, give them an insight into it? And that was fantastic for me because it just gave me a completely a blank slate to say, right, this is what I'm going to teach you. This is what I'm going to show you. And... I also like to make it um, a Q and A. So, thankfully, a lot of my friends in the industry have uh, have helped me out, and they've they've come in and answered questions. So, um, I'll give you some examples. Um, Steve Wilson, Match of the Day commentator, he comes in with me. Uh, Mark Scott's a good friend of mine, also commentates for Match of the Day. Um, my former producer, who's now retired, Nigel Dean, who's um, 
a fantastic producer who uh, who's um, who's now enjoying retirement. He comes in and gives his insight. I've got another friend who works on Sky Sports News, James Green, as a reporter. I get him to come in and give that side of things and the interviewing side of things as well. So um, although it's only six to eight weeks, I think it is, um, I just like to try and give people an insight into the job, get their views on um, what they think about the industry. Just try and offer a bit of advice. Just, I mean, it's an awful phrase, but try to give something back. Um, I don't do it for the financial side of it. it. It's just a really fun opportunity to talk to people coming into the industry. Um, and yeah, I've got another date coming up actually next month for doing, uh, they've condensed it this time into a three hour session. So um, I'll, re I'll really, really look forward to that, talking to the, the new first years. Um, and it's really interesting seeing them come out of school, go into university and um, get their viewpoint because, you know, <laughs> when I first started, that was like six or seven years ago. Um, we'd always talk about um, the, the famous Aguero moment. And actually for the guys who were coming into university now, they were like seven years old when that happened. So <laughs> suddenly it's not a, a huge memory for them anymore. So it, it's amazing how quickly the years flash by. You also post a lot of opportunities on your Twitter feed um, in sports in the sports media field. Um, and you kind of also alluded to it a little bit, kind of giving back. How do you kind of view your role now that you're in a very prominent position in helping people who kind of want to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, well, the, the jobs thing is just something that's completely snowballed. And I only did that because of the lecturing. Um, I saw a job which I thought would be perfect for a couple of my students, actually. And I thought, I'll, I'll tweet it and point them in the direction of the tweet. And um, yeah, it, so quickly, I was suddenly getting messages from people saying, oh, I've seen you post jobs. Would you post this job? And now on a, a daily basis, I, I wake up to maybe... Uh, sometimes as many as 200 messages, some from employers, some from um, people wanting advice, some from people saying, can you read my CV? Um, and I've just got a whole string of jobs every single day that I tweet out. I try to reply to everyone, um, but I've already shown you how crazy my schedule can be. It is difficult, um, but I do always try to get back to to everyone who who comes to me looking for a bit of help because I do think everyone in the industry we've all had help I've spent ages telling you about people helping me and and good fortune I've had I think we all owe it to the next generation to do as much as we can to to help them out and just offer them that little bit of advice and and you know even say you know um you're not doing that right you need to be doing this and I will look at people's CVs I, I saw a brilliant CV from a guy um a few months ago, I say a brilliant CV, the experience he had on his CV was brilliant, but the way he presented it was just completely wrong. He'd spent half the page doing his personal statement, which is just his own opinion of himself and completely pointless, then ages on his education. And he'd done all of these fantastic work placements. And it was just an afterthought at the bottom. And I said, you know, you've just wasted your time because someone looking at your application maybe spends 20 30 seconds looking at your cv they probably have missed all the important information at the bottom that needs to be at the top and we work together to to improve on that so i will if i've got the time i'll always help people out like that and i think um as you said you know i, I hate the phrase giving back but i think we've all got to try and do our bit because it is a really difficult industry it's notoriously competitive there are limited opportunities um and so if, if anything we can do to help, I think we should do it. Um, so you've cemented yourself as a commentator and uh, you've started to give back as a lecturer too, of course. Is there just um, anything else that you aspire to do now in your career or any future goals that you have set up? Oh, well, there's always something, isn't there? Um, you know, I was very fortunate. I did um, two European Championships and the World Cup for Talk Sport, um, which was great. Um, the last one I did was the 2018 one. Um, I'd love to do a bit of that for TV at some point. Um, obviously, you know, when you work for Sky, you want to be doing live Premier League football at some point. That's that's certainly a dream. Um, doing match choice is fantastic, and doing I absolutely love the live EFL stuff I do. That the the next step is live Premier League, um, but obviously they've got fantastic commentators doing that job. Um, so let's see what the future holds, but. Um, 
there's always there's always more you can do you always want more of course you do um but equally i think you know i just feel incredibly lucky and privileged to be doing what i'm doing and i really really love every minute of it um you know and 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 the other thing about being a commentator is you know you can keep going for many many years i mean one of the uh great names in the past is john helm he's still commentating now at the age of 80 he's still working for hbs as their lead commentator going all around the world commentating on all sorts of um away from fifa tournament uh, fifa tournament should i say um so you know you can keep going if you want to you don't have to retire at 65 so um yeah that, that's great I hope, hopefully i've got plenty more years in me yet last thing i really wanted to, to ask about was you know balancing you know having you mentioned you had a wife kids balancing that alongside a profession that's very demanding and has you out a lot how have you kind of managed that work-life balance well funnily enough actually when you've got um, really small kids it's a great job to have because neither of my boys ever needed childcare because um, I was at home a lot during the week um, I dovetail with my wife going back to work and then at weekends I was yes I was working my wife was at home so we didn't see a lot of each other but <laughs> the kids always had one of us there um, so actually that was quite good you know obviously as the kids grow up um, it is really challenging because things on a Saturday and sometimes on a Sunday um, I can't go to simple as that I've I, I have missed birthday parties and I've missed christenings not my own kids christenings but other people's christenings I've missed friends weddings um, that's just the way it is our own my our own wedding was on a Friday because a lot of the people coming would have had to miss games on a Saturday if we'd had it on a Saturday so I said no we've got to have it on a Friday and the people that weren't involved in football just had a nice long weekend so yeah that is difficult it is really hard i went to the world cup in south africa in 2010 and um at that stage we had a dog who was three my first son was two and we had a newborn who was two months old and i got on that plane thinking what have i done i've just left my wife at home with a, a young dog a toddler and a newborn and we had no family living near us at the time and she was just left on her own for six weeks so yeah, massive, ma massively challenging. She did brilliantly. Um, but yeah, I, I felt a lot of guilt about that. And, you know, w when you work in football, I think a lot of people will tell you that, you know, you, you do have those guilty feelings because you're basically working in a leisure industry and a leisure industry operates when everyone else isn't working um, by definition. So yeah, of, you know, there, there's always a downside to any job you have. And that that's definitely... That's definitely for us. You know, it is antisocial, no question. But my kids are used to it now and they're at an age where they don't care whether I'm here or not. So I'm through that. Awesome. Well, Gary, thank you very much for the time today. Really appreciate all the insight you've given uh, both Alex and I, you know, both prospective journalism students. And I'm sure everyone out there appreciates not only your Twitter feed, but also the advice you've given today. So thank you very much for the time. Yeah, Thanks, no worries, Gary. guys. Great to talk to you. This thank has you. been The Room from the LC Transfer Room.